Back in July of 2009, the first submission of um, the Queens and Longhorn Beetle was from Keao and Orchid Land. A resident, uh, I guess, found it on, on the screen of his home and then submitted to the Department of Agriculture for identification. Um, we did not have any specimens in our collection, so we did not know what it was. Um, we work with Bishop Estate and um, people, um, researchers from um, Australia. And uh, eventually we determined that it was um, Acalalepta aesthetica. Um, but we, we did not know a whole lot about this insect, the host range or its biology or behavior. Um, and that was just one in 2009. We did not know anything else. We never saw it again for four years. Until 2013, um, I think three other specimens was turned in. From all of the collections from Australia, most of the collections, or all of the collections uh, came from Queensland. So it, we're, I guess we call it the Queensland longhorn beetle from, from now, or that's its name, its common name. Um, the current distribution is on only Hawaii Island. Um, basically in the Puna area. Um, it's known to be from Keao, Curtis Town, Orchid Land, Pahoa, Hawaiian Acres, and uh, HPP, all over there. That's the hot zone. Um, some specimens were um, turned in from a uh, Home Depot parking lot um, as far as the county dump. And there's a few isolated incidents like um, maybe USDA, ARS, PBARC. But um, we'll see uh, what happens. But that's, that's where it's known to infest. The description, adults are um, an inch uh, and a half to almost two inches in body length. The antennas are one to two times the length of the body. Um, they're usually brown or dark brown, kind of velvety with a matty surface. Um, no spots on the body. And there's two spines near the neck that protrude um, perpendicular. The larvae are legless, they're kind of creamy colored, and they can reach up to two and a third, two and a half inches, mainly living inside of branches and the bark trunk of the trees. Um, pest status. The Calalata aesthetica is not considered a pest in its native range in Australia. Um, they probably have a lot of different biocontrol agents, such as egg parasites or larval parasites, or even larger predators that will eat the beetle. The information on the biology and behavior and the management of this species um, was kind of limited, uh, even, into, even for Australian um, authorities. They don't know too much about it either. But in Hawaii, it continues to exhibit invasive potential at this time. The usual signs and symptoms of the infestation. Um, the initial stages, um, you see sap oozing from where um, the young larvae are feeding. Um, there's girdling on the trunk and branches. And there's sawdust and frass uh, shaving, wood shavings that's being pushed out of the branches. And after they complete their cycle, there's a perfectly round exit hole about inch and a quarter. Um, a half an inch, and eventually um, branch die back and dropping. Now these are the confirmed hosts and unverified hosts that I've, um, we've seen so far. So, and the list is still growing every year currently. Kukui, breadfruit, uh, assorted citrus, queen sago, cacao, mulberry, cecropia, um, moringa, Norfolk pine, avocado. Um, croton and hibiscus, I still have a larva that is growing in their host. So I still have to confirm those as they turn into adult and we'll confirm them. 
Um, we're going to show you some examples of. Uh, well, um, as you see the one on the right, they will bore into the heartwood of the tree and, um, you know, that it, that's the worst case scenario. Um, and that's, nobody wants to see that in their trees. Um, just below it is the initial sap oozing from the branches or the trunk and I'm pretty sure you have uh, multiple larvae in that section there. Um, more girdling, um, you can see the woody shavings uh, exuding from the branch. More examples of uh, girdling and shavings being pushed out of the branch. The larva will bore down the center of the branch and eventually pupates in the branch. Adult will chew their way out and form a perfect half inch uh, circle or hole as they come out. Here's another view of um, a more of a younger, I guess kind of scraggly stress tree. You can see the wood shavings coming out of the, the main, main stem, main trunk of that. That's, that's one of the telltale signs of um, your infestation. Uh, take a look at the queen sago palm. It looks um, normal until you get up close and you see all the sap and, and the frass coming out of the trunk. Um, it eventually collapsed um, th from the boring. Uh, the structure was uh, uh, altered, so it fell over. I took it back to our, our office and I cut it up. And you can see from the walls, the, the tree wall, the trunk walls, it's um, being bored out, riddled with the tunnels. Um, you see from this, this one I took, I took out about uh, two dozen larvae um, just in the walls of the trunk. So, and they board uh, straight up to the crown of the, um, the, the growing point of the sago palm. It was a, pretty much a goner. Uh, mulberry, um, same thing. Frass, girdling, exit hole, um, more of the same. So we decided to cut it open, cut the tree down, and see what's uh, been causing that damage. Uh, same thing, the center of the tree is being bored out. Um, we picked out some of the adults and some of the pupa that were um, pupating in, inside of the trunk. So. That's, that's how we confirm that one. Uh, in my lab, we try to rear it out, put them in these small wooden cages, and we just feed them branches of uh, breadfruit. Um, I had to change it to like a wire mesh because they were chewing through the, uh, <laughs> the screen, the insect screen. Yeah, they have, Pretty powerful mandibles. They bite. they bite. So that's that's what they're doing there. They kind of gather in the darker corners of the cage. Um, okay, so I've uh, collected a female and gave her a a section of um, breadfruit so that she could lay in them, and then we can decide. We can determine the um, the age and how long it takes for them to cycle. So that's, that right there is um, uh, the OV position sites where they lay the eggs um, in the branch. Each little mark or nick uh, is where the egg are, are inserted into the branch. I still don't know how, it, whether she bites it or the ovipositor will um, put, the, um, put the egg inside. But I try to peel back the bark and, and you see the eggs under it. So that, that's the tip of the ulu branch. And I mean, to the untrained eye, you, don't, you wouldn't see that otherwise. But that's, that's how they lay their eggs into the branch. Is, is one egg 
Yes. One egg, one larva. How do they get the cavity that the egg goes in? I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen that late to see them do that. But yeah, it's five, like five millimeters in length. And I have some actual specimens that you guys can see over there. Um, so overnight, I will take out the eggs and put it in a petri dish and put it under moist paper towel and wait until it, it hashes. And um, it took about a week for them to hatch out. Um, and then I've put them back into ulu. I just give, make a slit and insert them into it and they're, they're fine. Yeah. Eventually, um, they grow up into bigger larvae and then pupa, then into adults. That's the pupa on the left. And then I just wrap it up in a moist paper towel and about three weeks later, they emerge as adult. The quickest I ever re reared um, from egg to adult was about three months. And um, I have still some that are the same batch that are still in larva form. Um, so it, it varies probably on the different um, thickness of branch that I give them or quality of uh, host material. Um, another one that I, I reared off of cacao took me eight and a half months for a one inch larva, which is about two months, so about ten and a half months to complete its life cycle. Okay, control. Um, some organic cacao farmers are handpicking um, their larva out of the trees. On one, on one um, field, ex field um, excursion, I was uh, excavating um, larva from a um, avocado, um, I guess, with a stump. And I've noticed like, um, like a fungus um, on, on the log and in the log. And um, it turns out that the larva and the pupa were, were, were more morbid. So I sent the fungus into our lab on Oahu and they've um, isolated uh, Fusarium, Verticillum, and Bavaria species that could be a biological control that is affecting them in nature. Um, currently we have them in um, rearing the isolation of the fungus and we'll see how that works if we reintroduce the fungus to see if it's a valid control. Uh, these are examples of um, biocontrol agents in other countries that hit the be um, same family of beetle in their native country. Like there's um, egg parasites uh, that hit cerambicid beetles in uh, China. So they target the egg stage. Um, some of these different wasps will attack the larval stage. Um, there's entomopathogenic fungus that we can try. Uh, we have some people from USDA that want to try entomopathogenic nematodes that uh, target larva, larval stages of um, various insects. But this is, is going to take um, a while for all this research to um, be conducted. Um, this is over the years, um, the number of submissions. Uh, yeah, um, 2019 was a record year for me. Um, slowly ramping up 2018 and then it just shot up last year. You know, at least over 75 submissions. And this is, um, I uh, plotted out the submissions from July 2009 to November 2018. So you can see when they emerge during part of the year. I suspect that June and July are kind of off. It should kind of round out at near the top. So April, May should peak and, and subside over the, the winter. But I think we can expect April, March, April, May uh, for um, beetle, um, people to submit start submitting beetles again. Stacey, and that's it. Yeah. Is there a seasonality there or is that just, I mean, is there are there like waves that come out every three months or? Um, I think it's seasonality right now because I haven't got a submission for the last 
two or three months. So I think it's going to be coming out in March, April, May. And then over the, the rest of the year, it just slowly declines. I, I submitted one sample, and I only did it because I saw an ad requesting samples. Could that potentially just be public awareness that they realize you're asking for Oh, maybe. But definitely, there's certain spikes like during the spring and summer. But not to say that, you know, very good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Kevin Hoffman. I'm the Plant Industry Division Administrator for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. So um, that was a really nice presentation that Stacy did. He's been doing some really good work on his beetles. So you're probably wondering now, what's the department doing? Um, so uh, when we found the beetle, you know, we, we have put out um, pest, uh, pest advisory as well as a fact sheet, and those are both available on our website. And we have hard copies here at the display over there. Um, we, we're we're uh, continuing to allow uh, Stacy to do research on the distribution and biology of them. Uh, we have um, reached out to uh, USDA and, and requested a uh, review by their new pest advisory group, um, so they can give us uh, some guidance on. Uh, um, how, how to go forward with, with, with uh, responding to this beetle, and also that gives us, um, if we get a new, uh, a new pest advisory group report, that also lends um, a little more support for getting federal funds as well to, uh, to uh, respond to the beetle. Um, we have reached out to CSIRO, which is uh, the Australian version of the Department of Agriculture, and, and uh, trying, looking at collaborating with them on biocontrol efforts. Um, you know, as Stacy said, um, it's not, this beetle is not well known in Australia, it's not much of a pest, so there's not a lot of information that we have on potential biocontrol agents there. Um, uh, oh, sure, yeah. Um, we, uh, the department continues to enforce the existing regulations that we have on inter-island movement of, uh, inter-island movement of uh, plant material. And so we don't, while we don't have a quarantine specific for this beetle, we do continue to, to inspect and uh, plant material that's moving between islands. And uh, we, we have not found the beetle moving in, uh, in those pathways yet. So right now it's still confined to Hawaii Island, to the, to the, great, to the, to the area where, uh, where Stacy showed the map. Um, any questions on that? Well, the, the, we worked with, we got the identification by working with the Bishop Museum and USDA and also researchers in Australia. So we we're really confident this is Acalelepta aesthetica as the scientific name. Now, we've noticed that um, it didn't, because it wasn't really a pest, it didn't have a common name. And, but, but now there's a lot of uh, stuff in the press and so forth, you know, calling it the, the uh, Queensland longhorn beetle. So we are going forward and we're going to write a proposal up to the Entomological Society of America to have that made the official common name for it. Is it classified as a pest or anything? It's not classified as a, as a pest in Australia. Um, and so the, one of the reasons uh, for, for doing the uh, new pest advisory group report is that the uh, USDA can then use their resources to kind of look into this, this species more as far as... Um, it's, it's ongoing. I, haven't, I don't have a, a, a recent update. We requested it in August. It takes some time to do these. Okay. Uh, any ideas of how these Greenlands get around the different groups? Is it like human transported? Or Likely human transported. Uh, with these wood boring beetles, um, uh, w one pathway, and I'm not sure this is the pathway for this in this case, one path pathway is a solid wood packing material. Um, uh, pallets, crates. Um, there, there's been, for a number of years now, international regulations on those kind of articles being treated before they get shipped. Um, and so you don't see as, you don't see as many, many instances of pests being found in them now, but it's still a possible pathway. But with, with something like that, you're talking about probably um, a warehouse, an importer, something like that that brings in you know, that sort of you know, you know, large amounts of stuff in crates or pallets. Um, this is this area where it's at is you know, more you know not real industrial. Um, another path, pathway is just in uh, large wooden articles, furniture, things like that, where they was made out of wood that, that had beetles in it. 
Um, the, the, the manufacturer didn't, didn't realize it, the importer didn't realize it, and, and, and they ship it over, um, you know, it goes into someone's house, and the beetles start emerging. And so um, that's another, another possible pathway for it to get here. But, uh, you know, it's only known from Australia, um, Queensland area. Um, you know, it's, it, it, like, it would have come through international trade somehow, either through solidwood packing material or other materials coming to the islands. CDFA is quite worried about this one. Um, I, 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 I actually worked for CDFA for 24 years, but before, yeah, before, I, before I came to Hawaii last year. Uh, we have reached out to our big, biggest nursery trading partner, partners, both California and Florida, and lured them about the beetle. Uh, CDFA has done a, 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 a risk analysis, and they, they've now rated it as an A-rated pest, which means it's a quarantine. It's a, if they found it in California, they'd respond to it. Um, Florida, Florida's looking at, at doing some research on it. What's CDFA? So, uh, oh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, CDFA is the California Department of Food and Agriculture. So it's, it's the California version of the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Just a lot bigger, actually. <laughs> yes? Do you know if X-ray or gamma ray radiation is effective on the larvae or the stages? I do not. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think Sheila's going to be talking a little bit. Maybe not specifically about that. <laughs> we have not. Uh, sure. Just to help with inspection efforts, would it be possible to like train dogs or something to inspect cargoes that come in to help control? That thing, it's always a possibility. We do we do have detector dogs for brown tree snake that we that we use on, on planes and so forth. We also have now detector dogs for coconut rhinoceros beetle that we're now getting into uh, in, into uh, the system. So uh, certainly it's something that down the road we can look at as a, you know, dogs are used for uh, that kind of stuff. So we, we, have, we don't have an active program to develop that yet, but, but it's uh, something that down the road we can look at. And would you be the person at Department of Ag who's like coordinating this effort or like who at the White Park? Uh, obviously, Stacy. Yeah. For things like that, for like new programs. Then it'd be me. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I'm, I, uh, plant industry division that I'm an administrator for, uh, uh, comprises of the plant pest control branch, which Stacy is in, the plant quarantine branch, which is the branch that has the inspectors at all the seaports and airports and does the nursery inspections, as well as the pesticides branch, so the branch that regulates uh, safe use of pesticides in the state. So they all fall under me. <laughs>